camera off. Okay, so welcome everyone, um, and thank you very much for for tuning in. Um, my name's Harvey, and I'm a third year photography student. Um, and this is the last guest lecture from this symposium entitled Rollback 21 Digital Futures Amongst a <laughs> Earthly Land. Sorry. And um, I'll be talking to Jem Southern today and we'll be discussing his what he's been up to in the last year and his kind of processes and photographic practice. And but first of all, I'd like to thank all the amazing students and people uh, artists that have taken part in this symposium and given us an amazing insight into their journey in photography. Um, it's lovely to hear everything, what everyone's been up to. Um, and and also I'd love to thank um, Maddie, Stuart Smith, Jasper Clark and Isaiah Cheng for organising this whole thing and bringing a lot of uh, ears and um, mouths together. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to be speaking with Jem and Jem is an artist and a photographer who's got a vast career and he approaches his subjects with such a, a sensitive and uh, you know he notices these things in the landscape he he, he approaches a specific places with with he, he, he approaches these places and he comes back to them like he's revisiting an old friend, which I like to think about it like that. Um, and, the, and the good thing about Jem is he he uses his his camera and he takes us with him, and he and he takes us with him on on these um, on these quests. He goes on, and we can travel through time with him as he revisits these places over over years, and. We can notice the subtle changes in the landscape as he as he visits these these places and whether it be the slow moving forces of coastal erosion or a pond in Devon, we are taken out of human time and we can touch the surface of geological time. And I just want to say thanks so much for Jem for coming and um, yeah, let's let's go. Let's go right into it. Well, thank you. There's a, shall I start then, Harvey? Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks. There's a couple, few things you said there, which really I think touched on me. One was this idea of uh, developing a you know, friendship with the site, which uh, I, 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 I certainly kind of feel. I actually sometimes feel the word. I actually fall in love with my site sometimes. It's a sort of very intense relationship. Um, and the other one is this is this idea of which we might come to a sort of moving outside human time, the perception of, 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 of human time. Anyway, this talk or this talk, this discussion with Harvey starts off uh, just over a year ago when I was uh, traveling in New Zealand with uh, our, our daughter. And this picture is taken on the second or third day of our journey. We had three weeks, she had a camper van, we had three weeks traveling around. And it was my third trip to New Zealand. And the first one took place in 2018 with my wife when I was invited to go and give a talk at a university in, in, in Wellington. And uh, they, they sort of flew me over and they said, look, I, we, I have some links with this university. They said, look, we want you to make some work in New Zealand. And I said, well, look, that's ridiculous because I, I work usually very close to home in, in Devon and England and I can't you know, come and make, and they kept on saying, come on, come and make some work. So I sort of said, oh, OK, I'll bring a camera with me. And I didn't want to take my big plate camera. So I took a small Sony and started traveling with my wife after after the talk. And uh, I just started taking pictures out the car window, the van window. This is one of them. Uh, and I loved them. I was just so excited by the idea of just being able to sort of sit in the, in, in, in the sort of seat of a car and just take. I'd never ever thought of it before. And it became a kind of road movie, really. So I made the piece of work. Um, I'd, I'd met a whole series of uh, photographers in New Zealand, really talented group of people working with landscape. And what became apparent to me was that they were deeply, deeply embedded, both in the physicality of the, the landscape itself, in the way that I you know, try and become, but also in the extraordinary complexities of their particular landscape, which are made much more challenging in a way because of the, the, the you know, the cultural um, 
uh, yeah, the culture between the, the ownership of the Maori and the ownership of the sort of colonial sort of tensions that exist in, in, in New Zealand. Work has to be made by New Zealand artists taking all of that into account. And I realized that I, I knew nothing like the depth that they were bringing to their studies and I would have to come up with something else. So the idea of making a, being a tourist it's something they couldn't do. They weren't tourists in their own land. So I said, well, I'm going to be a tourist and I'm going to make work as a tourist. And, I, and we just traveled and, 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 and went to places like this. This is Norfolk Sound. And um, the one, one thing I, I just decided to do before I set off was to do something for me, which was completely radical, um, which I'd never really done before. And that was, was to turn the camera around 90 degrees. So I, I went from being a landscape photographer to making pictures in a portrait format. And that simple move completely shifted 40, 50 years of picture making for me. I had to start working in a different way. And it was an incredibly productive um, sort of process. And, and working with these small Sony cameras, which I, I will talk a little bit about analog and Sony in a bit, which I've absolutely come to love my, my, my Sony, what it can deliver is extraordinary. So this picture is taken in a howling gale on a boat that was being bucked by, by, the, by the winds blowing up Milford Sound. You can see the, in the foreground the sort of the water being whipped across and so on. Um, I mean, with, with, a, with a film camera of any sort, you couldn't even begun. This, these, these pictures are made at about one or 2,000 ISO uh, to, you know, to, to, to deal with the speed. So I, I worked digitally. This is on the same trip. And what I talked to you know, earlier, well, a little bit before when I was talking to, to Harvey beforehand, about leaving things to fate. And one of the things that I've really enjoyed about um, working with the, with the Sony is, this is a picture of a waterfall, but the camera focused on the spray, which was just in front of me. So I, you probably can't see it, but there's just one or two tiny dots of spray, really pin sharp in, the, in, the, in, in, in this picture. And the rest of this is this glorious sort of soft shrouded uh, missed and anyway, a lot of rain in west in the western. This, this, these pictures are taken on the western part of the South Island. Um, Harvey knows this spot. What's it called, Harvey? The Packy Sand Dunes. Yeah. Um, what so, happened there? It's extraordinary. So, so uh, this is the the very north of New Zealand, right? Mm. And there's and a, people, there's people go here to these sand dunes, and they hire a, a kind of uh, a sort of sledge, really, a plastic yeah. sledge. Yeah. yeah. Drive to the top and then just whip down. And it's someone's made a really successful business. Um, yeah. It's really ramshackled. Just when 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 I went there, um, it was just a person on the side of their road. Well, they were just out the out the side of their yeah. house, and yeah. you know it was just foamies. They they were a little kind of um, much just, much the same. So so anyway, as you can see, but as well as the landscape, I'm kind of. Uh, we look at a couple of pictures like this. I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm always trying to make pictures that are about the whole experience of moving through a place. So this is staying on a farm, um, camping on a farm overnight, and just walking around the farm and coming across views like this. Um, very early morning on another farm, sort of metal crop farm. So as you can see, a pair of budgery guards in love. Um, uh, this is just the sheer sort of pleasure of going out with this camera and 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 and, and exploring, um, visiting museums. And again, it's another one of these pictures where the damn thing didn't focus properly, but would have put a sort of strange, strange sort of figure. So you, you, you're just being quite visceral about it. You're not. You haven't got any kind of preconceived ideas. You're just going around with your camera. Just going around and pointing the camera at things and and yeah. being led. I mean, I think what, mm -hmm. one of the one of the things I've really learned that I, is I like being led by the camera. Mm -hmm. I like the camera taking me on a journey. So uh, this is another picture out the car window, um, and and just learning to 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 let go. What something we might just touch on in a bit when I get to the ten eight, few ten eight pictures, is is the difference is 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 basically the idea of trying to let go. Um, and so this is as, this is letting go as much as I, I can. I'm a fairly kind of uptight kind of person, I would say. So um, 
you know, people like Wolfgang Tillmans and so on use a camera in the most extraordinary kind of lucid and loose way. And I've always admired that that kind of way of making pictures. And I find it very difficult. But this was this was letting go. And and each picture and and details of plants and, and so on. So there's a very I've got the plan was to make four visits. I was due to go next summer, last summer as well, for my fourth visit. So one a season. And to then somehow or other sort of edit these pictures, select down from these hundreds and hundreds of them in road pictures to, to make a body of work. Um, I'm not sure now if I'll ever make a fourth visit. Um, I hope so, but, but, but who knows? I've got to go to the South Island in winter. Anyway, here's, this is... I just thought I'd call this just making pictures because that's basically what I do. You know, I go out and I just try and make a picture. And then what often happens when I make a picture is that I go back and I find myself making another picture. But I thought I would start also to show you this. This is by Winifred Nicholson. So this is not one of her Cornish paintings. This is a, a um, uh, painting from Cumbria. And one of the things that I thought would be interesting to kind of mention was that I started photography in when I was at school, 19, you know, 15 year old kid, and I went to college. I left college when I was 22, and I had a 35 millimeter black and white Leica camera with a 50 mil lens. And I hadn't a clue after three years of college. All I knew is I wanted to be, a, you know, photographic artist. But there weren't there weren't any any role models then. We couldn't go to seminars like this or anything. There was nobody nobody in Britain really was. Well, how did you become a landscape? You know, photographer. There was, you know. um, and I spent most of my references were, were 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 with British and English sort of paintings, and um, when I sort of got going in the early 1980s, I was living in Bristol, and a young guy kind of turned up at a gallery that I was running one day uh, and told, you know, announced himself, said he was called Paul Graham, and um, he brought a colour processor with him into the darkroom that we, we built. And I started working in color using his processor. And uh, that, 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 that's sort of beginning really of my, 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 my career as a color photographer. And in the 1980s, we were a very small group of people. It's hard to imagine it now, but I can remember being in, a, in, a, in an article written in, in BJP, British Journal of Photography, about my first ever color show. And the article, in the article, the, the, the woman who wrote it said, Jem is one of a small group of British photographers who are exploring the use of colour photography. We call them new British colour photographers. And she went on to say there are at least a dozen people now making work with colour in Britain. And so we were just an absolutely tiny band, really. Mostly guys, but not exclusively. Um, but one of the things I've sort of realized looking back on it is that that was an incredible opportunity because we had a mission, basically, which was to learn how to make work about Britain in color as artists. And it's driven, you know, Martin Parr and Paul Graham and Peter Fraser and Anna Fox and, and, and so on. That, our generation, Anna Fox, is a tiny bit younger. Um, and I've always, I've always been that mission to, to, to basically explore how one can make work about Britain in colour. might sound quite daft today because there are just thousands of people working, hundreds, you know, working in colour. But in those days, it was really unusual. Um, Hard to imagine, really. It's bizarre. Uh, I mean, world of just black and white colour, you know, black and white, black and white people just uh, exploring the landscape with just monochrome. English landscape is monochrome. Yeah. You know, apart from calendars and so on. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, at college, I fell in love with, with, with the view camera and looking at the world like this, upside down in the, on the ground glass screen of a view camera. So for, you know, until, until 2015, this is primarily how I've been working, which if you think about it, is a bit of a crazy way to sort of stand on a, on a tripod, stand on a ladder up a tripod, looking at the world with a cloth over your head upside down, um, working in 10-8 in for much of the time, and shooting maybe 50 sheets of film a year, maybe sometimes 60, 70. So 
really making hardly any pitches, um, but, but, but trying to make each pitch count. And then earlier on, I was working in conjunction with the, with, with the plate camera, with a camera called a Plough Bell Makina, which the nearest example of it is the Mamiya 7s, which no doubt there's, you've got a whole lot of those at Falmouth, which, which are the sort of preferred roll, roll film camera of the day, rangefinder, you know, 6, 7 rangefinder camera. And the plow bell, everybody had plow bells. Mm. Again, Paul Graham, Martin Power, Peter Fraser, Anna Fox, we all used plow bells. And they completely sort of changed the whole way that British photography worked, I think. Um, it's extraordinary. So, yeah. That's that, that, you've got the rangefinder of the Leica, the, the quick kind of handheld thing, mm. but then you've also got the negative closer to 5.4. And the other thing about the Plowbell Makina, particularly the early ones, which was very helpful, was that the rangefinder was extraordinarily in inaccurate. Right. And that, although the focus was pin sharp, you never quite knew what you were looking at. So you would sort of hold the, hold the camera in front of what you were hoping to take a picture of and kind of learn to just intuitively move it around. So it sort of organized the, the, you know, the, the picture in the way you want. And this goes back to this looseness. So I was using a plate camera, which is a very, very precise way, you know, where you're aware of every sort of millimeter around the edges of the frame in conjunction with a much, much looser way of working. So this next picture again, I just put these in. These are both Plowbell pictures. Um, beautiful lens, very, very sharp lens, but soft. I found I bought a, I bought myself a, a Mamiya 7 about 10, 15 years ago. And I just had to, I couldn't use it. I sold it to Ollie, in fact. Um, because the lens is so hard, whereas the, the plough bell has this beautiful, soft sort of um, ton, ton, tonality. So, so those, with those two systems, I made, made a couple of pieces of work, the raft of carrots and the Red River, and then in the early 90s started working exclusively with a plate camera. And for the next 20, 25 years, I've been working with, 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 with a 10 8 plate camera. And I've done a whole series of bodies of work with, with that, one of which I call Rock Falls, which are these structures. This is the Isle of Wight. This is the very first successful rock fall I did in 1994. Um, and I became obsessed with these structures and I photographed them up until a couple of years ago. So there's sort of 25 years of, 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 of rock fall pictures and no, I don't know, maybe one or 200 prints. And one slightly strange, looking back again, strange side of my practice is that although I'm known for these rock falls, I've only ever exhibited about 10 of them. So all the rest, and they've never, they've, I've put about 10 in a book, all the rest are just waiting to um, be seen one day, which is a common theme of mine, which uh, you, know, you, might, you might sort of think is a bit odd. I suppose you want to wait as long as you can so that you know, if you think about the, uh, the geological time in, in relation to our human time, I suppose you want to wait as long as you can before you show them, because we only get to see a sliver of what happens in the landscape as it changes throughout our lifetime. That's an interesting way to put it, Hami. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the other hand, I'm getting on a bit and I'm wondering <laughs> if I'm ever going to, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the reasons for moving to these, 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 these pictures was to make much smaller pieces of work. I've been making the Red River took me five years, the Raft of Carrot took me about four. And although I love doing them, it's kind of exhausting business, putting together a piece of, you know, you never know how long something's going to take. You never know when you're going to start or finish. But it's an So I started photographing these because I thought if I photograph a rock fall, I'm just going to make one or two pictures of it over a period of time. And that's done. So this, this piece, I made three, three, three prints. And then this is the pond in Devon that you referred to. Um, it's just a few pictures of this. So this is the second picture I made of this pond. And the day I, I made this picture, I returned. I took the first picture, which I like, and I came back to just take another picture. And while I was taking this, a guy came up to me. It shows you how fate intervenes, really. And said, what on earth are you doing? I mean, there's me with a big wooden, you know, enormous great big wooden wooden camera on a tripod quite high up. And I said, I'm taking a photograph. And he said, oh, you know, it's a strange camera and so on. Why? And I said, well, you know, I love this green rectangle in the middle, you know, of this pond. 
And I and he'd been pottering around, and I said to him, "What are you doing?" And he said, "Well, I live next door on this pond, which was an absolute eyesore. Really, it was an absolute tip." He said, "I'm doing it up. The landowner doesn't you know, just let it run down completely." Um, and uh, and I said, "Well, what are you planning to do?" And he said, "I want to turn it into." And he told me that his plan as to how he wanted to landscape the whole pond and to basically create little runs of trees and plant flowers and have a seat to watch the sun set and a seat to watch the sun rise and keep chickens and have a little place for his daughter's pony. And I, I, he, as he spoke, he was describing to me what I would call an Arcadian realm, a paradisical space, an imaginary space that he wanted to create. And um, I, a lot of my work is to do with the way that we carry ideas of landscape in our imaginations. And imag landscapes exist more in our imaginations than they do out in, in the field, in a way, through childhood drawings and paintings and illustrations and, 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 and so forth. So I thought to myself, gosh, if this guy allows me, I'm going to follow his progress as he tries to create paradisical space on Earth. What an amazing thing to photograph. And I spent three years just going back about four or five times a year, um, looking at, uh, you know, just following his, his, his progress. So this, this pile of bricks here was to build a small jetty out into the pond for his boat, so he could sort of tie his boat up, which you can just see behind there. Anyway, he, uh, he, he deserted the project after three years. And um, I had about 15, 20 pictures. And I, it was the most exciting thing I'd ever done. And I was distraught that it was all over. And then bizarrely, a few months later, someone else took up the challenge of transferring this pond. But when I spoke to them, they had a completely different vision based on a, on a, on a different sort of mythic kind of narrative. And I spent another three years photographing the results of that. And so the whole work is six years following these two the labors of these two men as they try to create, uh, uh, you know, their vision of some kind of um, idealized space. And mm -hmm. it's, it's the sort of the strongest, I think the most interesting thing I've ever done. Never been published again. <laughs> I have, but I actually, I, I, there's a strange, well not strange, bizarre story. This land, is, this pond is on land. Own, I mean, it's a long, so I could, you know, I've given hour-long talks about this pond, so we must be careful <laughs> it's not too long. It's owned by, by a family that had been given the land around it by William the Conqueror. So this is, this is a huge estate that, that has been kept in this family for, you know, 800, 900 years. And um, the old man who, then, who was then the sort of, you know, Lord Iddersley, he was called, was had a reputation for being a really not a not a particularly kind of happy or pleasant guy. So, although I was working with the, with the bloke who he leased it to to do this this work, um, I was aware that he if he knew what I was doing he wouldn't be too happy. Um, even though I was just making a portrait about a dream, really. Um, anyway, I came to show the show works only ever been shown once in in Exeter. And um, I had to ask his permission because of the museum, which had a relationship with him. And we had a phone call and he absolutely flipped one of the most unpleasant sort of evenings of my life. He went completely bananas uh, when he heard that I'd actually trodden on his land and taken a photograph on his land. And um, I mean, literally bananas. He was screaming down the phone at me for about 10 or 15 minutes um, and tried to stop me showing the work. And I told him that you can stop me showing it next to, but I'm going to show these pictures around the world. Mm -hmm. And the more you shout, the more my, I'm going to be determined to do that. Anyway, <laughs> it put me off going back. Yeah. But I, do, I go back once a year just to have a look at it, but it's completely changed now and is, is not really, yeah. Most sites I've returned to, like the Red River and so on, this, one, this one's over, it's done. So this is this is a year into the second vision, as you can see from just these two. It's a it's a very different, uh, much more controlling um, uh, vision. Fences and eventually right. the trees and the flowers got dug out and and just banks built up and and so forth. Anyway, that was six years, and about fifty fifty pictures.
I've just got to plug my computer in. So, but I wanted to show you some of those because, because in a sense, you know, I am a kind of an analog person. And here's, here's a later series of, of, of rockfalls to give you an idea about the way these work. So this is a, a rockfall. It's actually in Normandy. I, I did do occasionally move out of Britain. And this is one site which I absolutely fell for. And I got about 20 pictures of this rockfall taken over about five or 10 years, which just slowly transforms. And it's this fascination with looking at, as you say, the sort of, each, each tide changes this Harvey. You know, a tide comes in and changes it. And then I go back six months later and the rocks have shifted slightly and the light's different and the coloration of the rock face is very slightly altered by, you know, some earth slipping down. Yeah. And so, so you're going from the human as a, a force of nature to the nature as a force of nature. Purely geological, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah, and, 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 and I'm a child of what I call land art. I grew up land art, people who made work in response to Robert Smithson and so on. I was very interested in that. And in a sense, I see these as sort of natural sculptures. They're studies of sculptures, really, transforming sculptures. And then that's the picture we saw upside down. And in 2008, we're jumping around a bit, but I'm just bringing us up to the moment. I started making a piece of work on the River X, my local river. And I spent about four years photographing the river at a number of different sites with a 10-8 camera. And that eventually morphed into something else quite accidentally. Uh, one, one winter I started photographing and I had a particularly productive stream of pictures. And I found a poem by, by Edward Thomas, which talked about the passage of winter and how we can't perceive the passage of time, in, in going back to your point early on. And so I made a piece of work called The River Winter, which was published by, by Mac in 2011. And uh, the idea that was just one winter. And then I started going back and I photographed the next three and a half winters. So I've got three more winters. And I've just got a few of those because something weird happened in my life around the time that, that I just done the book with Mac. And that was that I've never been able to print my work properly ever since. Because Kodak and Fuji, Fuji abandoned making the paper I was using. And the Kodak paper is too punchy. And my negs just don't print. And so I've got three, four years of, of 10, eight negs I've never ever sort of looked at, never printed. Um, so, so would you say that this is like a turning point in your, in your yeah. career? Yeah, this is this is this this is it, and so I've got all these negs to want to look at because I don't I don't know how to scan properly. So the next few pictures, these are these are later pictures, and these are my attempts to scan. <laughs> scan. I mean, I quite like the results trying to scan scan the negs. So I don't really I'm, I'm not very good at sort of scanning. So um, I've got all this work which remains sort of largely well unprinted really. Um, these are just. Um, scans, but they lead on to, to, to what I've been doing for the last few years. So this last picture, really. So anyway, there's all that work, which I never even looked at, which is a bit crazy. But um, this, 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 this plot is very important because uh, in 2015, December, I even got the day, um, one day, I decided to, two things happened, really, very close to one another. One was um, that I was still teaching at this time and so many students were using digital cameras and I, I'd sworn to myself, I'm an analog person, I'm never going to touch digital. Uh, and, but, but the analog world was disappearing so fast that, that I was beginning to wonder if I was actually going to, you know, to be able to keep on working. And so I thought I'll buy a digital camera and just see how, see what happens. And I bought one, this little thing here, if you can see it, which is a weird camera, it's called a Sigma. Um, it's horrible to use. I mean, the quality of the, the images, if you can make it work, is extraordinary. So I bought another camera, a Sony, one of the first Sonys, and um, just started wandering around with it, not really knowing what to do, just testing it out. So I thought, well, at least I can sort of have some idea about what these things do, so I can talk to students. And then, 
uh, at the same time, I, I had an accident. I fell downstairs. Um, and I landed on my elbow and smashed my arm to bits. And as a result, I couldn't use my 10.8 camera, so I could only use my, my right arm with this Sony. So I used to go out with the Sony one-handed and just take pictures. And because of that, I set the ISO very high to stop getting camera shake and so on. So I always use at least a 1,000 ISO. And I was sitting here one evening in December 2015. Dusk had fallen. And I was just, I was having a bad day for various reasons. And I was just looking up, up the river here. The river's running past. And suddenly, um, all my woes, I realized, were being kind of, sucked away by just being absorbed in, the, in, 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 in this place, watching the river go past and the ripples and the current and watching the trees and the reeds float away. And there was a little red cloud just illuminated by the last rays of the sun passing in front of me. And suddenly these two birds, mallards, just pushed themselves out from the bank. And I lifted up the, the camera and took a picture. Totally innocuous moment, nothing happening. But it changed my whole life. Because um, for the last six years, <clears throat> I've been going back to this one spot, either at dusk or dawn. And rather than wandering around looking for a picture, I go somewhere or other and I wait for something to happen. And uh, the whole work is called a bend in the river. That very first evening as I walked back to the car, I thought of the title, a bend in the river, and I thought of the methodology. And I said, I'm just going to come back here through the rest of the evening, uh, the, you know, the evenings of winter, going back to my interest in winter again. And I'm just going to stand here and wait for something to happen. And I did that, and the pictures weren't that, that good that year, but I enjoyed it so much, I decided to go back the next year. And the next year, one evening, this sort of thing happened. So I started being able to make pictures. So this is exactly the same spot where I was. And suddenly, right, 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 the, the deep dusk, it was almost dark, these two little wrens came onto this tree and started running all over it, feeding. And I just pointed the, 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 you know, the camera at the tree and went click and took a couple of pictures. And I just loved this little picture of this little bird just sort of tucked into this, this, this bend in, in, in the wood. And I realized that I could start making pictures of the same places that I'd been making pictures before, but actually registering a whole different set of things, you know, birds, clouds, light. And that's what I've been doing. And the next year, um, one evening, this group of swans um, sailed past and I took some pictures. This is taken almost in pitch black. So these are this, this pictures, I've got about 10 to 15,000 ISO on this. There's an immense amount of noise on this picture, which I've had to fight to try and sort of, you know, get away from. I could hardly see the birds when I took this picture. So the camera is beginning to sort of, you know, deliver um, something beyond even vision. And I, I, I'm absolutely, completely and utterly, you know, awestruck by what digital technology can, can, can do now and it offers me a new opportunity. So I made a piece of work that winter about these swans. Whoops, no one here. So these, these are all just on this same bend. Those are four swans. So the swans feed on the um, on, 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 on the floodplains beside the river during the day. And then in the evening, they fly down onto the river where they preen, drink and, uh, and so forth and socialize. And then they go round the bend to sleep. And uh, I thought after a while, I wonder what they do in the morning. So I started going in the morning. This is a sort of late evening picture. And in the morning, they come back. And I made this work of, of this, these two movements, the swans coming down onto the water and doing their bit in the evening, and then in the morning coming back around the corner and then eventually flying off. So here's, here's a picture of them flying off. And there's about 40 or 50 pictures in this, in this, in this, in this series. Um, and um, they were actually due to be shown in Bristol. Last weekend, they were due to open. I had an exhibition as part of the Bristol Photographic Festival. And um, they got cancelled due to the pandemic, unfortunately. So I'm having, it's been put back two years. So I'm, I'm, I'm waiting, but I went back the next year 
to start all over again. It was such an extraordinary experience. And um, did another series. This one was just all in the morning. So these are just dawns. Um, and again, I, I visit about 40 times a, a winter. And I get onto the riverbank in the dark, about an hour, hour and a half before sunrise. Um, and uh, wait for the for the light just to begin to get a glimmer of glimmer of light, and then start photographing through. And I leave just before sunrise. So they're basically a sort of a, the idea is I, and I, I, I I I'm trying to get one picture every day. So each work has about forty pictures in it. Uh, I've just got a few to show you. Do you think? This uh, this series would have been possible if you hadn't moved to digital. Completely. I mean, this 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 this, this is 10,000 10, ISO. Mm. This this is um, with and this is with the Sony with a stabilizer. No, no, no. I, I mean, you wouldn't. This 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 is a twentieth of handheld, twentieth of a second, one point eight at ten to fifteen thousand ISO. Well, I mean, with with a film camera, even not a plate camera, you'd need a five minute exposure to to begin to get some kind of you know light registering on film at this 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 time of the morning you know well i've got pictures of birds flying around so it's utterly utterly kind of digital it's about going back to the theme you know about the earthly world it's about being grounded in the earth in a totally different way from from the 10 eight Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm I'm sharing dawn with these groups of swans, geese, and ducks. There are ducks in all, almost all the pictures of swans, um, and and making. I mean, I enjoy making these. You know, to me, it's very exciting making these pictures. And I've got a I've got about 200 yards of riverbank, and I go and I put myself in a spot, and then I spend about half an hour there, and then I'll move down to another spot. So I've got about three viewpoints, and it's a place on the river where these birds gather. To, to to roost and so I share the coming of dawn with them you know that they, they wake up um, so this bank is where a whole lot of swans when the river's at a certain level swans go onto the river for safety during the night no foxes around and so they'll go onto this bank all sleep there all by bit, and then this is they just slowly wake up and they take about an hour to do their their morning rituals before they all take off and I tell you something, it's quite it's quite a sight and, and you know, to, to 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 experience thirty or forty swans, maybe, you know, sometimes one or two, taking off simultaneously and being able to make work about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely kind of digital, you know. There's no way. Um, Have you always had some birds. Yeah, well, I, I come from my dad was an ornith you know, a very keen ornithologist, so there's a lot of birds in my pictures these days. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, I always wanted to make pictures, but with a 10.8 camera, you know, it, you, you can't photograph birds with a 10.8 camera. They don't, you know, my exposures with a 10.8 camera are usually, you know, 10 seconds to 10 minutes. Um, birds, birds, birds aren't there. So I'm, I'm, yeah, and what's, what's, uh, it's lovely, I, you know, as you can see, I'm, I'm, I'm just ex sharing dawn. It's a very, very, um, uh, it's a wonderful thing to do. Get up in the dark, go down there. I mean, I've just finished my sixth winter and uh, I've got so many bloody pictures of swans, you know, that that I can't imagine anybody being interested in, in a quarter of them. Um, but I'm, you know, if I can, I'm gonna start again next winter. It's just such a, such a wonderful thing to do. Well, here's a group of them taking off. And there are various sort of, you know, other ideas buried in a work like this because um, I've now photographed 10 winters, five on, on 10, eight and five or six on, on, on um, digital. And of course, each winter is a completely unique experience. And this idea of following a passage of time, which is a very different one from the rock falls. So this is a season. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of encompassing, you know, four or five months, three or four months in, 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 in a group of pictures. And if you say to somebody, what was last winter like? 
you remember bits of it, but but basically, you know, this has got the fluctuation of the river. Every day the river's at a different point. The wind's blowing from a different direction, which changes the turbulence of the surface. And um, the birds behave in different kind of ways. And and as, you know, climate change is altering our, 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 our landscape, so the birds are responding to that. So I'm making other work of birds, which also relates to, you know, tangentially to climate change and things like that. Here's another one of these, another di totally different visual picture. So when I first got this camera, I just started going for walks. And this is a walk in the um, Norfolk Broads. And again, this this is a kestrel just flying through a huge rainstorm. My wife and I were walking. We got absolutely hammered by this, by this squall. Um, and I'm taking pictures in the middle of you know, the camera's just getting completely sodden in the middle of a of a squall and a kestrel flies by and to make a picture of, you know, a moment like that. So they become, yeah, they be, I'm, I'm, I'm moving sort of register of time, really. Or another rain picture of a garden. So during the, during the, the lockdown, here's another bird picture. I, Harvey, you've got any questions? I can go on talking as you realise. Yeah, no, uh, please, please continue with your uh, with your lockdown project. OK, well, one of the things I've been doing then is is I've got a big backlog of, 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 of work. And so I've scanned most most of the five, four and six, seven work that I did over the last sort of 30 years. And um, with a view to sort of wondering what to what what to begin to do with it. And one of the things that's exciting about this was that I've I've made two pieces of work now where I've actually used social media as the platform for making the work. About four or five years ago, I made a piece of work on Twitter where I went out with my iPad just locally. I walked 200 meters from where I live in any different direction um, with the iPad and just took pictures of trees, doors, furniture, bricks, anything that I found that interested me. And I would post a few pictures each week with a piece of text. It was an image text piece. It's called St. James's Halt. I haven't been on Twitter for a long time, so I imagine it's still there. It's the biggest piece of work I've ever made, you know, 400 pictures, image text, about one place, just being embedded in, 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 in one place where I live. Um, and, I, and I thought it was rather interesting making work and using these platforms to actually present work. So this summer, last summer, I found these legs, and this is from when I was teaching in Falmouth. My brother, who I was living with in Camborne, um, it, uh, had his young family in a little garden. And one day this fledgling blackbird appeared in our garden. Now the garden was, there were three cats, dog, lots of chickens and ducks and things in this little garden. And uh, this bird had obviously left its nest a bit early. My brother's something of a uh, but he's even more of an ornithologist and a naturalist than I am. He's, he really knows his business. So he decided he'd better take this blackbird indoors to look after it. Otherwise, the cats were going to kind of chew it up. And uh, I, I just took some pictures. So these are taken on a 5-4 plate camera, handheld, uh, on, of, 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 of this bird. And I just, just took some. And over the last summer, I decided to start posting. I just found them and I thought, oh, that'd be rather fun. So I posted the story of this blackbird, a picture a day for about 10 days or two weeks, again with a piece of text. So it was an image text piece. And I've only got a few um, pictures. Um, I only shot about 15 next. So it was only about 15 pictures long. Um, and one of the things that was quite interesting was that... Um, Last, last last year when I was doing this, was that I've got about, I don't know, I'd get about three or 400 people liking these pictures. I don't know how many people follow me. Um, and people really got very attached to this blackbird, you know, and the story as it was slowly kind of unraveling. And each day, and I would talk a little bit about the area and the blackbird and my brother's life and so on. And then in one picture, which I haven't got here, I introduced three cats. There's a picture of the three cats. And someone said, oh shit, you know, What's going to happen to this blackbird? Well, somehow or other, it managed to kind of like stay out of their way um, until the final final story, which eventually one of the cats ate it. Um, 
So it's a bit of a sort of bleak story, but it's all full of hope. And then it's got a rather bleak ending. And I was in two minds as to whether or not to actually tell people what happened to it, because they were getting so attached to this black yeah. bird, even though this happened in 1982, this is. Um, so anyway. It's very different than to how you usually present your work. So now you've got uh, an audience that is participating with. Yeah, the... yeah, it's tremendously exciting. Yeah. And I, I don't know if a lot of people make work on, actually make work on Instagram or pay, you know, they show lots of pictures, but to actually mm -hmm. make a piece of work, I found it immensely exciting. And as you say, because, because people were commenting and I was commenting back. And so you have this dialogue around the work as you're making it, which. Which might, might tell what they might want to see next, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I say, well, unfortunately, you know, I can't, yeah, there's there's because this is 30 years old or 20 or 20, 20, I don't know, 982, 40 years old. Um, uh, you know, it exists as a story, there's nothing I can do to change that. So, that's one of the things I've been like many people trying to find ways of keeping myself preoccupied during lockdown. Another one has been going back and looking at a series of pictures I did before. Um, well, as I was doing the Red River, I did this at the same time. Um, these are a series of pictures called Paintings of the West of Cornwall. And as you all know, there's been this tradition of artists working in the West of Cornwall. And I spent four or five years in the 80s going around Cornwall, digging out wherever I could. I could find a painting of Cornwall in, a, in an artist studio, but or in a shop window or in a B&B &B, or in a bank or whatever. And I made a piece of work that looked at the way that People painted Cornwall, and these are a couple of pictures of the most extraordinary place I found, which was a gallery on the Lizard, in the last house in the Lizard, run by a woman, an old lady who ran this gallery 364 days of the year. She closed on Christmas Day and um, presented these paintings to, to visitors to sell. So I've been going through that, and. The other thing I've been going through is, this is another, this is pre-colour. When I moved back to Bristol, I started working from, from college. I started working in black and white eventually. And I spent six years photographing the city docks in Bristol, which were just about, they'd been run down, were just about to begin the process of regeneration and buildings were beginning to get knocked down. So these big white buildings in the distance are bond, bonded warehouses where sherry and and tobacco and so on would be kept in what was called bonded system and they were eventually sort of blown up and knocked down and, and rebuilt. So um, I took all these pictures and I published my first photographic book with a writer friend of the history of the history of the of the floating harbour as it's called in Bristol. And um, I've always wanted to take the pictures back because anybody who knows Bristol won't know the docks as they were, you know, in in, in the late 70s. And um, in June this year, I'm going to have my first, no, my second exhibition of these pictures, which is going to be in the docks. And it's going to be because they, my show of the swans was cancelled. The Crystal Photographic uh, Festival has, has, is going to be putting on a group of these, 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 these pictures, which is very exciting. So I've been getting these ready to, uh, to, to, yeah. to present. I find this fascinating, Jim, because these are so vastly different to the works you've just showed us on, mm. on River X. Mm. And I was wondering, you start out black and white industrial landscapes, and now you've gone through all your work, and and we've we've ended up with, uh, on, you know, on 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 a, on a bit of river as well, mm. a, a, a changing landscape, but. We're looking at things far from any human touch. Yeah, well, yeah, it's farmland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, one, of, one of the things that's exciting, I'm, I'm 70, um, is, I, I mean, I fell in love with the photographic medium when I was a student, well, before I was a student. And I decided when I was a student, that's all I wanted to do was to take pictures using a plate camera um, of the English landscape. That was my kind of mission in life. And I was just very fortunate to, to, to be in Bristol and to set up this photographic gallery with a friend, which, which acted as a catalyst of, of people come, came to I didn't know anybody when I set it up. And when we set it up, suddenly photographers started coming out of the woodwork. And you know, as I said, Paul Graham turned up and then Peter Fraser shared the darkroom. And I just happened to be with a group of people 
who, as I said, had this mission to sort of, you know, push out and to take photography somewhere. And uh, that energy has just, I've just managed to sort of surf the energy that sort of was created at, 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 at that time. And it's just been, and, uh, but always trying to, in a sense, invent something new, always trying to just move on. I, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 it's exciting to be moving. Peter Fraser has just been haranguing me about the new Fuji 100S that's, that's just come out, which is the latest piece of technology which everybody's rushing towards if you can get hold of one and afford one. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's exciting to have this. I've got no idea what, you know, I don't know what I'm going to be photographing tomorrow, you know. Um, but to be that open, to just allow oneself to, to go out. The, I started taking these pictures in the docks because I was working in the Armafini, which is where I was working one day. And some guys started knocking down a building opposite. And I had no clue what to take photograph, but I had my camera. So I went around and took a picture of this old shed being knocked down. And I suddenly thought, well, wait a minute, the whole of this doctrine is going to be, er er you know, the same thing's going to happen. I can, I've got a mission here, you know, I could become, you know, and I said and that one little incident led to six years of, of work. Uh, when I first moved down to Cornwall and took my brother's dog out for a walk one day, I just stumbled over this little stream running through a field, a red stream. And I thought, wow, I'm going to follow the string. Six years of making the Red River. Um, so everything, ha nothing happens with me <laughs> deliberately. I didn't intend to spend six years photographing kind of swans, but I just sat by a river one day and watched these two mallard ducks. And it's taken me on a journey. And by being as open as I possibly can to allowing bits of new technology and then being led by the camera and led by, by you know, where where things take me. But this, this is another, this is something else I've been working on. This is more birds. So anyway, yeah, just lots and lots of different, I'm always working on about five or 10 different things and I pick one up and put one down. So this is a study of, for the last 10 years, I've been making work about spring. So each spring I make a new piece of work and I've got no idea each spring what it's gonna be about. I've just started going out with this little thing I was showing you the other day, a while ago. Um, but these are these are gannets, and um, a few years ago I got rung up by a guy I was at school with, who now is a dinosaur tracker in Colorado, and said I'm coming back to Britain to sort of visit some gannet islands because his father had written books about gannets. Do you want to come with me? And so we went on a on a on a sort of three or four week journey around gannet trees around Britain, and uh, I made a whole series of pictures of seabirds. These are, this is a diptych. This is the left hand side, this is the right hand side. Fabulous creatures. This is, this, this, will pin, this, this, so this is a spring series from about four years ago. So these are my spring series. There's a blackbird in this tree on the right. So these are all bird pictures walking. There are goldfinches up in that tree in the distance. That's a blue tip flying. From one nest site to to get some more bird stuff for a nest, and it's just thrilling being able to kind of make a picture that's sort of as dark as this one—a blue tit flying across a, a field. That's a blackbird in the rain on top of the greenhouse. So, you know, just 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 allowing fate and the medium to take me on these journeys, and 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 not knowing at the start, you know. One, one might be one picture, might be might be years of, of, mm. of just exploration. If, if it's okay, um, I and uh, sorry if I'm kind of prematurely throwing questions here. No, we've been going on for hours, so we're um, nearly an hour. But, yeah. um, just sort of on that note that you're you're mentioning there, Gem, of this idea of fate um, leading your practice. I'm I'm really curious about how you arrived you know how, how that how you found that workflow initially when when you um started to take photography you know seriously at the beginning of your career was was that a kind of process that came to you naturally or was it more of a kind of learning curve it, it, it was learning i mean i left college with with this Leica and a 50 mil lens and an ambition and i had absolutely no idea i didn't take a picture in two years after i left college 
And then I knew I wanted with the plate work with a plate camera, so I bought myself a 5.4 plate camera. I had no idea what to point it at. And I had it at work in a bag with some film in the side, and, and that building got knocked down opposite. And that's, that, 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 that set me off. And um, I mean, I have a, I have a kind of a, a natural temperament, I suppose. I mean, one of the things, again, I, I learned very early on, and I learned it first with Paul Graham. Presumably you've all heard of Paul Graham. That Paul was, is, was, as a very young man, the most extraordinarily talented and precocious guy. And I realized very early on that, that he was vastly brighter and better photographer than I was. And that if I was ever going to do anything of any work, I would have to develop my own way of working, which was very, very slow, patient, just slow building of something. And also when you teach each year, you know, you, you, a group of students will turn up and you'll realize there'll be a number of people in that year who, first of all, are vastly better picture makers than you'll ever be. And also, you know, come up things. I mean, I've taught some extraordinarily talented people over the years. And so, in a sense, I, I had to learn to, to work to whatever my personal strengths were, which, were this, was, which turned out to be this very slow, patient, accumulation of, of work and, and, a, and a sort of deep study of something, you know, just um, people make much deeper studies, but to spend six years photographing one, that pond I showed you, I, I took, I didn't take a picture outside of that pond, which was 50 meters square, maybe smaller than that. And to, and to keep making pictures, new pictures, in, uh, in, a, in a very, very sort of tight, area like that is it was a real challenge but actually that challenge is what made the work if i'd said to, i could just go and photograph you know anywhere um it, it's 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 the, the restrictions the constrictions actually help help me make work i think it's the same with everybody you need to set a set of boundaries and and your set of rules so when i was using the plate camera one of my rules was that i put the horizon through the middle of the camera and then i balanced the, the composition up and down from 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 that, um, and it's just just it just helped me. So just finding finding your own way really, and being incredibly patient, and um, it's not easy, you know, spending fifty years. Um, well, it's not difficult, but you know, it's, it's a relentless process. I've known so many talented people who, in a sense given up because because you know it's 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 not straightforward perseverance yeah 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 you just got to persevere basically and follow follow your own you follow your own 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 vision i was just very lucky to i mean if i was to start nowadays i think i mean i i even though i do instagram i, I in a sense i dread instagram because every day I look at hundreds of wonderful pictures taken by amazing photographers all over all, all around the world, and I'm stuck here without a clue as to what what I want to do and what I want to take a picture of, um, because the world is almost deafen, deafening now with 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 so many talented people, and I'm I'm not sure how I would kind of cope. It's one of the reasons I went down to live, you know, I left Bristol, was that I realised that if I stayed in Bristol with all the people like Paul Graham around. The noise of their presence around me would have made it very difficult for me to concentrate on the work that I've, I've done. Yeah, that's very interesting. I think that is it's quite relatable, you know, with how uh, we share work on Instagram, and there's a lot of anxiety around comparing ourselves with others. It's, it's horrendous, isn't it? Yeah. And um, yeah. I think President Roosevelt, I was reading this the other day, I can't remember the language he is, he, he, said, he said comparison is, is, is the thief of joy. You compare yourself to other people, it can erode the, the joy of your life away, you know. So you need to be, yeah, it, it's quite, so, so when there's only 12 of you working in colour in Britain, it's kind of easier, really. What would you say to a student who is comparing themselves or would you say if they, they're wondering where where to go no they're, they're wondering what to photograph oh well that's very simple 
um, go for a walk and, 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 and just see what, you know, so, you know, when I was teaching, you know, I'd just say, you know, go for a walk, go out somewhere or somewhere that interests you or whatever, and come back and let's look at the pictures and, you know, look at a 35 millimeter sheet of contact sheets and, and say to the student, rather than me say, well, that's a nice picture and that's a nice picture. So what's happening here that interests you? Is there anything here that interests you? And, and why? And so we would sort of take a little contact print and say, well, what is, what's going on here? So maybe can you learn from that, 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 from that? And then whatever it is, then next week, go away and do that and then come back and we'll look at that. And gradually, you know, you kind of evolve, you know, evolve something. Don't, what I would desperately say is don't go and sit in a library and thumb through books looking for inspiration. Go out uh, with a camera and, and make work. If that's, you know, if that's, if that's your, um, you know, it doesn't be, it be a landscape photographer because go meet somebody or, or, or whatever. Work basically, and and follow your follow 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 follow, follow your instincts and be patient. Don't expect to, to 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 you know. I didn't have my first exhibition until 13, 12, 10, 12 years after I I no yeah ten years after I left college. I had a small exhibition. So you know, don't expect it to happen. In a, in, a, in, a, in a rush and just just make the best work you can um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean where we've gone over time a bit and um, I'm, I was wondering if anyone in the comments had any questions um, they can post them and we can see if we can answer some yeah um, quickly if you want to carry on for a bit is that what you're saying Gemma is there have you got any more pictures to show us I don't know Oh yeah, well I could do if you want to look at more pictures. You've seen enough. This is some last winter. This is the winter I've just finished. I finished this two weeks ago. So there's another 40 dawn pictures <laughs> of swans on the river. Um, so you know, I can hardly I can hardly see them when I'm making this. This is really really early on in the morning. Just a glimmer of light. Sometimes there's no birds. I, I actually have another question, um, uh, which which was, Jem, you know, in your transition to digital, um, sorry if it's a bit of a cliche one, but I'm curious to hear, if, like, you do you miss any part of the any any part of that mechanical process of working with a plate camera, the kind of ritual of yeah. setting it up? I, I miss it hugely, yeah, and I miss the pictures. I mean, when I was looking at some of the that picture I showed upside down, which again, I've never, at the beginning of this, this session, which I've never printed, I've only ever seen it on a screen. Um, I can remember taking that picture. I mean, they're just such a, it's such a different, I mean, I'm, I'm 10 foot up on a ladder with a bloody great big tripod. What I don't miss is carrying 25 kilos of kit. Um, you know, the Rockfall pictures are taken just you know, hours of slogging along kind of beaches where I shoot two legs in a in a in a in a in a in a, in a day, walking along a beach, and it's an it's it's a fabulous way to work, absolutely fabulous. Looking through a ground glass screen, and and making pictures just so slowly, I I love it, but I've got a I've got a you know a slight problem in that I I haven't got a subject anymore. I've I've sort of I, I haven't got anything that I want to photograph with a 10-8 camera. And until I can find something, um, I'm, I'm more than happy going out with a with a digital. I've got a fridge with about two or three thousand quid's worth of film just sitting beside me, waiting to. It's going off, you know. I haven't shot a sheet of film in four years. Uh, I really want to go back again, but I'm not sure how I'm going to do it. Because until I find somewhere I want to photograph, um, uh, I'm a bit stuck. Go for a walk, Jim. Yeah, 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 good one. But honestly, go for a walk carrying carrying that kit. Bloody hell. Yeah. You know. I mean, the Sony's, I mean, my friend Peter Fraser, who I'm very close to, we spend a lot of time talking. You know, I used to, he used to, he, he moved to, to working with a small digital camera way before I did. And I'd go and stay with him and he'd have a little bag about this big, you know, about 12 inches by 10 inches by 8 inches in which he had everything he ever needed, cards, cameras, batteries, charger. 
and he'd just get in his car and go off to the Alps to make pictures. Mm. And I, I was sort of looking at my, you know, 10 kilo tripod and two backpacks and ladders and umbrellas and, you know, I mean, it, 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 it <laughs> yeah, I miss it. But, but I've got to find um, some, got to find some, something to point the camera. I did a whole series of, I'm looking down my garden. For 20 years, I photographed, I just pointed at the camera down the garden, took pictures down the garden. But eventually, we built a studio for my wife down there, and that spoiled that series. That was in the middle of the most almighty rainstorm. It's the last picture from this winter. Anyway, um, any more questions? So I'm, uh, I've got my eye on the Instagram, and I don't think we have any questions. We had we had Nicholas F, who said that the story of the blackbird was one of the highlights of his summer last year. Oh, well, that's very kind of him. Yeah, um, that's a comment really. But um, otherwise, we're we're just sort of ticking over the hour mark, and um, I can happily sit here indefinitely, really. But I don't want to take up too much of your time, Jim. Okay, here's an interesting picture. So this is, we're going past, so this, this is a very, very early digital picture. So it's a rock fall. And right on the right hand side, you can see a tiny bird, that's a rock pipit. Mm. And so going back to, to Harvey's interest in time, to be able to make a picture of, there's 200 million, well, I think it's 160 million years of geology in these rocks, which have just been continually being laying down and eroded. And here's a little bird. And to be able to, to so this is a very early, this is a Sigma picture taken very early on, to be able to make pictures, which I could, you know, the Sigma's got this extraordinary um, sensor. You know, I can make prints about three foot by two foot off this camera um, with this bird, pin sharp. Um, to be able to sort of visit these same sites and, and, and to sort of have these different registers of time and experience. Is, uh, is, is, is fabulous. But one of the things I decided to do when I got hold of the digital camera quite quickly was to deliberately make pictures that were unlike anything I'd done before. What I didn't want to do was to sort of try and simulate um, the way I've been seeing with a view camera. That just didn't work. I don't know if there's anything else here. Oh, that's just something completely different. Do you want a, do you want a quick story about this one? Yeah. So this go was... On. This was, a, this was one of my absolute delights, really. And this goes back to, to the point we were making. So one, I was very lucky to be invited to go on, a, on, a, on an art science cruise in the, in the Hebrides about six years ago. It was a tall ship, sails and everything. There were about 15 of us, about 10 artists and a few scientists. And the idea was that we discussed climate change. So it was sort of funded by some sort of project. And we all arrived on this boat not knowing one another and very quickly sort of, you know, lovely group of people. And um, we learned to put the sails up and take them down. We had to sail the boat. Um, and one night after about four or five nights, we were, um, we anchored at night underneath some rocks on the north side of Rum. And in the middle of the night, uh, there was this God almighty round whole boat and everybody just piled out of bed it was an alarm and, and and met on the deck and got dressed and so on very quickly and there was a professional captain on this boat and he says the anchor's dragging and we'll be taking we've been we're being pulled onto the cliffs and there's no point putting another anchor down because we'll be put off so what we're going to do is we're going to set up some sails and we're going to head off out to sea very slowly so we all set the sails up and uh, he left one woman, American woman, at the wheel. He said, that's the moon over there. Just head for the moon. Just point, the, you know, just keep going slowly to the moon and we'll be fine. So she was left up on deck. It's about sort of half past 12 at night. Quite high up, so, you know, up in the north of Scotland. So it wasn't that, wasn't so dark. Anyway, I was just going down into my cabin. When I looked through the rigging and I saw the moon shining up there and on the water in front of me. And I thought, God, that's an amazing view. And I went down, I got into bed, and this bloody image just haunted me of, 
of, of the moon. So I got back up, and one of the cameras which I use, an analog camera, is a Pentax 67. And I had that with me and my Sigma, which I was using, and I put a roll of film into this Pentax, and I couldn't really see through the viewfinder. I, I, uh, I, I looked down into the pent I looked down into the thing rather than using the pentaprism. Um, but I thought, well, if I just basically kind of randomly focus and I'm going to stand on the back of the boat and point the camera forward somehow or other, my light meter, which was an analog light meter, didn't register anything. So I said, I'm going to have to guess the exposure. And I basically stood there on a rocking boat, hand holding this camera, moving around, breathing in and out. And the exposures, I guess, were anything between, I don't know, 10 seconds and about a minute. And I just kept on firing exposures. And I shot four rolls of film between um, that time and when the sun came up, dawn. Um, without any idea of what was going to, you know, happen at all, and uh, they're just amazing. I love them. And this is this is the moon here, this weird mark, um, and this is about a thirty-second exposure with the with me moving up and down, me breathing, everything's moving, um, uh, and um, they can't print analog, so they're they're sort of they're, I, I've, I've scanned them, and I made a piece of work which. I used at the beginning, some of which I used to be near the moth, and it's called Journey by Moonlight Through a Hebridean Sea, and it's just six pictures, um, which I've never printed, um, but I know maybe one day I'll print, um, and so I made a piece of work that morning, done, and to be able to make a piece of work that fast, you know, uh, so I know I, I like the idea, of, I, I try and build this in, where you, you know, sometimes I make a piece of work in 10 minutes, I'll just go down a field and look at some flowers and just take some pictures and think, right, that's done. That's a piece of work. And so making work which has, which is very elastic from one, 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 one night on a boat to, you know, sort of six years of, of winter. There's something wonderful about that elasticity, really. So anyway, that's that picture. Yeah, it comes back to the, the idea of fate. And how perhaps if you weren't caught in that rock or what is ever putting you in, you might not have seen the moon the same way. It happened. It all just just completely, yeah. Fake. So so being being open to 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 kind of your possibilities, mm -hmm. and 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 having an understanding. So somehow or other, I had this deep understanding in my mind. I think that I knew my Pentax well enough. You know, I'd been using it for twenty years. I knew the film well enough. And I just somehow or other intuited that if I just did this, something might result. And um, and it did. And so, you know, when you study photography, I suppose it's it's you can you can you can learn so much. But basically what all you can do is to really learn that you have to keep studying and keep working with the medium. So just build up and build up and build up and build up this sort of understanding of, you know, the medium to allow you to to respond to situations when they present themselves in this kind of way. We, we've actually got another question from uh, Nicholas on Instagram about this picture you're showing here, Jem, um, mm. where hopefully I can paraphrase it right. So um, he's, he's asking, so th this is from your archive and um, you showed a photo of a rabbit uh, from the plowbell earlier, um, which are both from um, the moth, if that's correct. Yeah, and, I use them in the moth. Yeah, yeah. And so Nick, Nicholas is asking um, how much of, you know, to what extent the moth was was made up of archival work. In well, what, what? Okay, okay. Well, what 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 happened was that before I started working on the Red River, I took the first picture of which is in the moth of a man standing by a beach. In black and white. I was working with my plan, my plow bell in black and white down in Cornwall, didn't have a roll of colour film, and I took this picture of a man standing, looking out to sea, which is the, the first, you know, not the first, but one of the, the starting point of the moth. And um, I kind of knew as soon as I took that picture that I wanted to use it and make a piece of work about it. And I tried to make a piece of work all the way through alongside, and, and it sort of morphed into the, into the Red River, basically. And at the same time as I took that picture, 
I read a poem which is called The Seafarer, which is an Anglo-Saxon poem, um, which, which is a, about a man, the loneliness of a man's journey across a frozen, frosty sort of sea and him sort of bemoaning his fate. There's a, there's a, there's a word um, that the Anglo-Saxons had for fate, which is weird, not spelt quite like our word weird, weird. Weird is set fast. Fate is, we are locked into fate, basically. And um, uh, I, I kind of wanted to, to make, a, and, and, and so I started making pictures around this idea of, you know, fate and, and the story of this man. And it didn't work. And then when I finished the Red River, I started trying again, and that didn't work, and it became the Raft of Carrots. And then I just kept it in the back of my mind. And about six, eight, ten years ago, six years ago, something happened, something rather sort of, it was actually around the same time as that, um, that eat that night, it's the same event, my brother basically was dying. And I, um, it was his death, basically, that set me thinking about this idea of, of taking these pictures and working um, his, his, his demise and what happened to him into, the, into that series. Uh, not not explicitly, but it's what gave me the you know he, he his death gave me the sort of the idea for the framework of the work, and so um, it was a it, it it became this idea of someone being locked into fate, and I didn't have I I had these pictures of the idea was this man was standing by the sea, looking across the ocean. I don't know if you those of you who don't know the moth, but basically he's someone who's left Cornwall which a lot of Cornish miners did to go and work in mines on the other side of the world. They'd sail across the world. Most of them never came back, but they dreamt of, you know, their, of, they came from Cornwall. They dreamt of Cornwall. They, they, you know, they named their towns, their houses and everything after Cornish name. So I imagine this person standing on the other side of the world, thinking back to his, his, his life and how fate had taken him to the other side of the world. Um, on a tall ship, and so suddenly I thought, wait a minute, I can use these photographs. This was just completely blue. So the rest of the work was actually slightly using the archive, but it actually I'd been 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 working on this thing for for 20, 30 years, and and then these pictures just I just suddenly realised I could use them to suggest this idea of a of a sea voyage. So that was that was that was luck. There we are, Nicholas. Um, that's just, that's the, the gist of it. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so, uh, if that's uh, all the images, Jim. I don't uh, know what's next. Well, these are just these are just new. Uh, these are pictures that I took out of the New Zealand one. Yeah. Could, could you go back one actually? Because that, 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 so that's that's me making a rock fall picture in New Zealand. Yeah, fantastic. So what, how, how, when return to these motifs, yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah. So yeah, like how, how was it kind of returning to a motif on the other side of the world? Well, I love it. I mean, it, it, you, you know, one becomes, I mean, one of the things that you learn, I think, uh, about your, 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 your work as you grow older, well, as I did, I mean, maybe you will realise this, is that nobody will get inside your work in the way that you do. You know, you, you are so involved and so preoccupied and you know all the nuances because basically my work's about me basically in my life and my response to the world and, and and investigating that through the act of kind of making pictures and how i am at certain stages so the rock falls are about being a dad my dad my children were just born and i realized slowly that that they were they they, they were reflecting on what it what it what it meant to be, be a father it might sound a bit odd to you to say that but that that's partly what they're about um um, and so one's work is absolutely, it's so dense that you've been working for 50, 60 years, you know, making work. It's so dense and only, only you're ever going to know that most, you know, 90% of what's in your pictures are, 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 are basically things only you will ever know. Basically, um, you, you know, you'd spend your life talking about them and people wouldn't be very interested either. Um, but but there, but it's interesting. But what's what? What I like is is 
you know, this picture allowed me to sort of just reflect on, you know, being, being a, a rockfall photographer in New Zealand. So I'm just revisiting sort of something, and, but, but it's a slightly different shifted motif. And, and it's extraordinary. So, for instance, those early pictures that we saw of, the, um, of that dove locked in its cage, I hadn't realised until I started editing the pictures down for the moth that almost all the photographs of animals that I've taken, and I've got a lot, you know, there's about 10 of them in the moth, Every single creature is chained or locked in. It goes back to this fate idea of fate again, the way that we're locked in. So in the pig, lamb and the goat picture, if some of you have seen that, the, which is this beautiful picture of these three little creatures, just, just the pig, a lamb and the goat in a Cornish field. The goat's chained down. There's a chain around the goat's neck and it's chained down. You can only just subtly see it in the picture. And there's sort of a metaphor for how all of us are, are basically locked into the journey of fate through our lives. I don't want to get too, you know, I believe, I believe it very powerfully that, that in a sense, um, we, we talk about having free will, but, but, but in a sense, our lives are, you know, the constraint of where we're born, you know, how we're born, the society, the class, the condition, you know, it, you know, how we grow up, what happens to us at school, you know, all of those things, sometimes, unfortunately, sometimes, well, so one of the problems I have with modern politicians is that none of them have got out the bloody playground. You know, I mean, Boris Johnson and, and so on are still basically struggling for their little, you know, fighting out how they fought on a bloody school of eaten playground type thing. You know, they haven't grown up. Um, uh, so we're all, we're all, you know, locked into our, 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 our kind of fates in a way. And, and those, those animal pictures are all part of that. And these rock falls are about fate as well. Um, anyway, so it's, it's, you know, going, going on and on and on inside one's own work. It's a very rich, 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 rich process, you know. But, but, but rarely does, I mean, you, you, you're very kindly give me an opportunity to share some of it with you this afternoon. No, 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 no. some interest mm. it's been a beautiful kind of insight um seeing how your work's changed over the years and um and how you're thinking about photography now with with, with new techniques and um well yeah. actually, just one one lesson to you all is without wishing to sound like too much of an old man really giving you a lesson is is that don't imagine the world that you inhabit now will be the world that you inhabit in 10 or 20 or 30 years time. It's going to change. Mm. And so, so you have to, you know, move, move with it and be, 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 be part of it. God knows where photography will be in, you know, 2050. Be somewhere, somewhere absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? People still, you know, be, we'll have pictures of people's heads or something or other, you know. So, so one doesn't just learn a set of skills and, and, and then just spend the rest of one's life, you know, unraveling them. It's, it's a continual process of the journey of, of, of it all. And, and, and being open to that and realizing that is, is you know, incredibly rewarding. Mm. I think that's a fantastic place to end, don't you? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. Well, thank you. I want to just thank Jasper and I can't remember the, and Maddie and you, Harvey, and the others for inviting me and Ollie for um, putting us in touch. I hope some of you have found that interesting, etc. Thank you very much, Jem. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a real honour to, uh, to chat with you. Um, and uh, yeah, have a good have a good rest of your day. OK, I can rest um, up now. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Jasper.